In this video, you will get a complete overview of the GPIO header you can find on the Raspberry Pi board. The following applies for Raspberry Pi 4, but also Raspberry Pi 3 and 2. I will also sometimes make a few comparisons with the pins you can find on an Arduino board. And note that I'm not going to write code here, but instead focus on the big picture and explanation of what you can do with each pin. All right, let's get started. So the Raspberry Pi board has a GPIO header with 40 pins, as you can see here. GPIOs allow you to easily control hardware components and communicate with other devices. It brings the Raspberry Pi much closer to hardware applications, making it perfect for being embedded, for example, in a hardware application or a product, like a robot, a retro gaming application, etc. And a quick word of caution here. Before you plug anything to a Raspberry Pi pin, you have to know that you can easily damage the board if you do something wrong. There is no real hardware safety when it comes to the Raspberry Pi hardware pins. So if you connect a ground pin to a 3.3 volt pin directly, for example, well, you might destroy your Raspberry Pi board the second those pins are connected together. So be careful when you plug something or when you create a test circuit. If you have any doubt, double, triple check and ask someone for help before you burn anything. But if you follow some basic rules and common sense, you will have nothing to worry about. Now let's start with the ground pins. The ground is very useful for making a common reference between all components in your circuit. Always remember to connect all components to the ground. If you connect two circuits together, add a wire between both grounds to make it common. If you add a new sensor or actuator to an existing circuit, connect the ground of the component to the ground of the circuit. That is very important. Without that, you may burn some parts of the circuit, you may have components that do not function correctly, give wrong values, etc. Eight of the 40 GPIOs are connected to the ground. You can find them with the three letters GND, like you see here in black on the screen. Then we have power pins. You can find two pins bringing 3.3 volts and two pins bringing 5 volts. Those pins can be used to power components such as sensors or small actuators. Note that they are certainly not powerful enough to actuate motors such as servo or stepper motors. For that, you will need an external power source. And the power pins are used as a source to power external components, not to power the Raspberry Pi itself from an external source. That's very different. And as a small parenthesis, well, there is actually a way to power the Raspberry Pi from the GPIO header but with this, you already have a good probability of just burning your board. So just use the micro USB port for now to power on your Raspberry Pi. And the power pins are to power on external components. And also just another word of caution, well, don't ever connect one of the power pin directly to one of the ground pin of the Raspberry Pi. Okay, then you get two reserved pins. The pins 27 and 28 are reserved. They are actually used for I2C communication with an EEPROM memory. But if you just begin with Raspberry Pi pins, don't connect anything to those pins and there are many other available ones for you to use. So with the ground pins, the power pins and the reserved pins, we already have 14 slots taken and 26 left. And actually, now let's see how the other 26 GPIOs are used for communication. So GPIO means General Purpose Input Output. Basically, a GPIO is a pin you can use to write some data to external components as output or read data from external component as input. If you embed your Raspberry Pi board with some hardware components, the GPIO header will become quite useful. GPIOs will allow you to read some basic sensors, for example, an infrared or push button, control some actuators. Okay, think of the actuators which are working with an on-off mode, for example, an LED, 
And you can also communicate with other hardware boards, such as other Raspberry Pis or Arduino boards, BeagleBone, Jetson Nano, etc. The Raspberry Pi GPIOs are quite similar to what we call digital pins on Arduino board. First, you need to choose whether you want to use them as input or output. If you configure a GPIO as input, you will be able to read a value from it, high or low, which also means the max voltage or zero volt. And if you configure a GPIO as output, you will be able to write a value to it, also high or low. So digital pin or GPIO has only two states. Low usually means zero volt and high means 3.3 volt with, of course, some tolerance here. So that's very simple. It's like a switch that you turn on and off. For the code to actually read or write a state to a GPIO, you can use, for example, the rpi.gpio Python module, which will make things very simple for you. And this video is not a programming tutorial, but if you want to learn Raspberry Pi from scratch and write cool programs to interact with the GPIOs, check out my Raspberry Pi online course in the description of the video. With this, you will be able to create fun and interesting projects in just a few hours. And now let's talk about voltage. All GPIOs work with 3.3 volt. It is important for you to know that in case you need to plug a component with a different voltage. Sometimes you will find sensors that are powered with 5 volt, but all the communication pins are running with 3.3 volt. In this case, no problem. You can use the 5 volt power pin from the Raspberry Pi to power the component and then use any 3.3 volt GPIO for the communication. If you don't mix the 5 volt signal with the 3.3 volt signals, everything should be alright. Now, if you need to make your GPIOs communicate with 5 volt pins, for example an Arduino Uno or Mega or some sensors, you will need to use a 3.3 volt to 5 volt level shifter like you see on the screen. So you can either buy one or build one by yourself. And note that if you use 3.3 volt Arduino boards such as Due, Zero or M0, you won't need to add a level shifter and you can plug the Arduino pins directly to the Raspberry Pi GPIOs. All right, that's it for the main functions of GPIOs, but there is actually much more to it. You can use a few hardware communication protocols directly with the Raspberry Pi GPIOs. Those communication protocols are in fact the same ones that you can natively use on many Arduino boards. With those protocols, you will be able to transfer far more information than with just a bunch of GPIOs configured as digital pins. On the Raspberry Pi pinout schematics here, you can see a colon for alternate functions. Well, we have many communication protocols there. In fact, saying that a GPIO is a digital pin is an overly exaggerated simplification. It is much more than that. For each GPIO, you have at least one alternate function and sometimes many more. But let's keep things simple here. You don't need to know all the alternate functions to get started and develop cool applications. If you're interested though, Check out the BMC2835 datasheet, okay, this is the datasheet for the whole GPIO header, where you will see a complete table with all alternate functions for all GPIOs, and I'm going to put the link in the description as well. So let's see what communication protocols you can use here. First, the UART. UART is a multi-master communication protocol. This protocol is quite easy to use and very convenient for communicating between several boards. Raspberry Pi to Raspberry Pi, or Raspberry Pi to Arduino, etc. For using UART, you need three pins. First, GND, so ground that you're going to connect to the global GND of your circuit. Then you're going to need the RX for reception. This pin, you're going to connect it to the TX pin of the other component. And then the TX pin, which means transmission, you are going to connect that TX pin to the RX X pin of the other component. And if the component you're communicating with is not already powered, you also have to use a power pin to power on that component. And note that by using a UART to USB converter, 
you can communicate between your laptop and Raspberry Pi with the UART pin. Now, to use UART in your code, you can use, for example, the serial library in Python. After UART, let's look at I2C. I2C is a master-slave bus protocol. Well, it can actually have multiple masters, but you will mostly use it with one master and multiple slaves. So the master is the one initiating the communication and the slave is the one responding. The most common use of I2C is to read data from sensors and actuate some components. The master is the Raspberry Pi and the slaves are all connected to the same bus. Each slave has a unique ID so the Raspberry Pi knows which component it should talk to. For using I2C, you will need three pins. First, a ground, okay, I guess you already know that, to make common ground with all components. And then SCL, this is the clock of the I2C. So you connect all the slaves SCL to the SCL bus. And then SDA is for the exchanged data. And you connect all the slaves SDA to the SDA bus. And then, of course, if the component you are going to use needs to be powered on with 3.3 or 5 volt, you can link the VCC pin of the component to one of the power pins of the Raspberry Pi. And note here that the SDA and SCL pins on the Raspberry Pi are alternate functions for GPIO2 and GPIO3. When you use a library for I2C, those two GPIOs will be configured so they can use their alternate function. And if you want to use I2C with Python, you can have a look at the SMBus Python module. All right, and to finish with communication protocols, the third one we get is SPI. SPI is also a master-slave bus protocol. It requires more wires than I2C, but can be configured to run much faster. As you can see, you get two SPIs by default, SPI0, and SPI1. It means you can use the Raspberry Pi as a SPI master on two different SPI buses at the same time. And as for I2C, SPI uses the alternate functions of GPIOs. So for using SPI, you will need five pins. First, GND. So you will need a ground to connect all components to the same ground with your Raspberry Pi. Then you have the S CLK, which is the clock for the SPI. And you are going to connect all clock pins together. Then you have the MOSI pin, which means master out, slave in. This is the pin to send data from the master to one slave. After that, you have the MISO pin, which is the opposite, master in, slave out. This is the pin to receive data from slave to the master. And then you have the CS pin, which means Chip select. And pay attention here, you will need one CS connection per slave on your circuit. So by default, you have two CS pins. You can see CS0, which is GPIO8, and CS1, which is GPIO7. You can also configure more CS pins from the other available GPIOs. And to use SPI in your code, you can import the speedev Python library, for example. Well, now you have a complete overview of the Raspberry Pi pins and what you can do with them. Once again, you can never be too cautious when manipulating the pins. A mistake can destroy your board in less than one second. But if you pay attention and double check everything, there is no reason you will burn anything. Now, if you feel lost with so much information and don't know where to start, here is a list of steps you can take from there. Get some simple examples and just do them, like powering on an LED, read the values from a button, etc. For that, you will need to create a small circuit on a breadboard and you will use the pins with their primary function, so the GPIO standard function. Once you are familiar with how basic circuits work with ground, VCC and communication pins, try to get a more complex sensor, for example an I2C accelerometer, so you can measure whether your board is on a flat surface or not. And after you know how to communicate with one sensor, try to communicate between your Raspberry Pi board and another Raspberry Pi board, or with an Arduino, with your computer, etc. using all three protocols, the UART, I2C, and SPI. 
You will learn a lot just by doing that. If you liked this video, subscribe to get more tutorials like this in the future. Also, check out my online courses so you can learn Raspberry Pi step by step in an efficient way by practicing and directly going to the point. Links in the description. Alright, thank you for watching. See you in the next tutorial or in one of my courses.